Hi, this is Keith Kaiser with another lesson from God's Word. We've been looking through Luke's life of Christ, and we're working through the narrative about our Lord's birth, how he came to earth in this amazing way, a true miracle done, that it was without human agency. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and the Holy One who was born of her was called Son of God. He was the eternal Son of the Eternal Father, co-equal with Father and Spirit, and yet one who became truly man, and yet a man without sin or fault or any kind of spot or blemish. We read in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She considered the shepherds who came and what they were saying, praising and worshiping God and talking about the angels who had said that unto them was born this day a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And Mary was going to store these things in her heart. You know, at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 1, when there was about 120 believers gathered together there in Jerusalem, we see that Mary was with them. And what a wonderful resource she would have been to confirm a lot of these incidents uh, that happened in the life of Christ. And imagine hearing uh, from Mary's own lips about the angels telling the shepherds and how the shepherds came in and worshipped our Lord when he was but a baby. And she remembered these things. She stored them up. Now we go on and read in verse 21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So this shows us that the hallmark of Joseph and Mary was obedience. They were, first of all, obedient to what the Word of God said, because the Old Testament told them that on the eighth day, they should circumcise their baby, Jesus. Now, that's not in force today, uh, because we as Christians are not under the law as uh, any kind of means of trying to please God. And that was part of that ceremonial law given to Israel to teach them certain things. They were basic principles to teach them separation from the Gentile nations that worshipped false gods. And circumcision was the sign given to Abraham and to his physical descendants through Isaac and the people of Israel. And so the Lord Jesus being born as he was, as Galatians 4.4 4 says, being born under the law was here circumcised, and it was right that it should be so. You remember when Paul wanted to boast about his Jewish credentials and all of the religious attainment he had before knowing Christ. He was using that sarcastically to argue against some false teachers uh, that were coming to Philippi. And so in Philippians 3, one of the things he points out of his past life was that I was circumcised the eighth day. It shows the serious observance to, of God's word, that his parents scrupulously kept the ceremonial law, that they circumcised Paul the eighth day. And we can say about Joseph and Mary, they believed in the Bible. They believed in what God had told them for their time, and they practiced it. They took the Lord Jesus to be circumcised on the eighth day, or, or had that done. In any case, then they bestowed on him this name, Jesus. And this further shows their obedience, because we remember that they were told that they would call the baby's name Jesus, for he would save their people, uh, save his people, rather, from their sins. And so that great name Jesus, which means something like Jehovah saves or Jehovah is salvation, or if you prefer Yahweh saves, Yahweh is salvation. Uh, the Lord saves, the Lord is salvation, Lord in capital letters. All of these appear in the various translations and scholars have said them all, but they all mean the same thing. That this is pointing to the fact that the true and living God who has made promises to Israel and promises in the New Testament to the church that he is the God who keeps his word. He's the faithful covenant-keeping God, and he is a God who saves. And that salvation is to be found in the name of none other than the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 would confirm that. Neither is there salvation in any other name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. And so the Lord Jesus is that authoritative Savior, and it's through his death and resurrection and his ascension back to heaven that now 
people can enter into a full salvation before God. They can know that their sins are forgiven. They can know that they have a righteous standing before God and that they're reconciled to God, brought back into a right relationship with him, adopted into his family, made children of God by being born again through faith in Christ, and also being declared sons, having responsibility in the family of God, receiving from the risen Christ the Holy Spirit that every believer receives when we are saved. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us, even as the Lord Jesus said in John 14, that the Father and the Son would come and make their abode in us by that other comforter, by that other helper, some translate it, even the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Truth, as he's called. Now, the wonderful obedience is demonstrated here because they don't name Jesus after some other person in their family or because they like the sound of the name. They are being obedient to what they had been commanded by God through his angel, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb, verse 21 says. So it shows us the scrupulous care they had in obeying the Lord. And it's amazing how so many people come to God's word with a more cavalier attitude, that they say, well, I'll take the bits I like, but the other bits I don't like, I'm just going to leave those. It's true, we have to rightly divide the word of truth. We have to understand context. We have to understand history and progressive revelation, that certain things given to Israel in the Old Testament do not continue on, like the food laws or like circumcision. Jesus himself would abrogate those things later in his ministry. For the food laws, see Mark 7, and eventually what he says to Peter in Acts 10. And so we have uh, God modifying certain things in the Word of God, or rescinding things that were given for a temporary time. But that notwithstanding, the authority of the Lord Jesus is carried in this Word. This Word is the means by which the Spirit of God sanctifies us. The Lord Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. And that's the primary tool that the Holy Spirit uses to shape us and make us like Christ and for us to interact with the living God. It says we read the Bible, gazing on the Lord in glory, so to speak, that we are conformed to his image. And that is the teaching of 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 and Romans 8 and other passages of Scripture. That as we look by faith into this word and look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God takes that word and he writes on our minds and hearts his law. He writes down what he wants us to do as far as the commandments that the Lord Jesus has given us. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the evidence of genuine faith and genuine love for the Lord Jesus Christ is that we obey his commandments. And Joseph and Mary here are an outstanding example to us. We should imitate them as they imitate Christ. Now their obedience is further seen in verse 22. When you look there, you see, Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Again, this is scrupulously in keeping with what the law had enjoined. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Now think of that. Every baby boy born to the Lord was considered the Lord's. Have you ever thought of the fact that you as a human creature, as a creation of God, made in the image of God, that you bear the imprint of the God of the universe, the God who existed before all things, the God who is the judge of all the earth, that you were made by him and therefore you were made for him. Not only were you made through him, but you were made for him, the Bible says. So you could ask yourself, have I ever thanked God in the first place for making me? Have I ever thanked God, what's more, for giving me the opportunity to become part of a new creation. Because the sad thing about that first creation is it was marred by human rebellion, by our sin, by us not believing and obeying the word of God. When our first parents disobeyed the word of the Lord, the stark consequences were immediately seen. They felt alienation 
before God. And we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So each of us knows that feeling of alienation. We're not born the first time coming into the world having a personal relationship with God. True, he's put eternity in our hearts, Ecclesiastes 3 says. And so uh, what may be known of God is revealed in us, as Romans 1 puts it. We know there's a God, but we don't have a personal living relationship with him till we repent of our sin and ask him to save us. Till we say, Lord, I don't want to continue on living in alienation, living separated from you. I want the new life that comes from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know I can have it because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, put away my sins, and rose again to give me new life, eternal life. And so I can have a relationship with the living God. No, we belong to the Lord in at least a twofold sense. Number one, that we're creatures of God. We are made in the image of God. He created us. But also in the secondary sense, and even more importantly, I would argue, that the Lord died to redeem us. He wanted to buy us and to buy this whole world. Don't be like those false teachers that Second Peter 2 talks about who deny the only Lord who bought them. You see, the Lord has made a way to redeem us, but you can refuse that payment. Someone could come if you had the problem of you doing something wrong and you're put in jail, and they could come and say, well, I posted your bail. And you could say, well, I don't want anything from you. Thank you very much. I think I'll stay right here in prison, or I want to stay and make a point behind bars or whatever, whatever the reasoning might be. They can refuse the bail payment. They can refuse to come out. And the sad thing is that although everything has been done to save you, that the Lord Jesus cried out, it is finished. He paid the right price on Calvary to set you free from sin, to save you from the judgment your sins deserve, to save you to a new life with God. The Lord Jesus did everything necessary, and yet you can say no to him and refuse that payment. I hope you won't, my friend. What an awful thing to be lost to continue on in that life of alienation, not knowing why you're here or where you're going. And I can tell you, if you reject Christ and don't believe on the Lord Jesus, if you continue to ignore Christ, sooner or later, you're going to leave this world, either by death or the Lord is going to come. And you're going to be cast out of the Lord's presence forever into the lake of fire, into what Jesus called outer darkness. May that not happen to you. May you turn to the Lord while he may be found and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Now they were presenting their son as holy to the Lord. And I can't help but think that Moses, when God gave him that command to give to Israel, could not fully imagine what it would be to have the Lord Jesus Christ come and be the fulfillment of this in the sense that no one in history ever before nor since Jesus Christ has ever been holy like he was. In other words, he was the one who was completely sanctified from moment one in the womb till his last breath on earth on the cross when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Every thought, word, and deed of the Lord Jesus Christ was for his Father. He was obedient, obedient even unto the point of death and that the death of the cross, Philippians 2 says. So here was one who was truly holy in every sense of that word, separate from evil, separate unto what was good, but ultimately separate unto his Father and his will to please him in all things. And there they offered a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. It says in verse 24, a pair of young turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, of course, Leviticus permitted that offering, but they could have given more. They could have given a a lamb or a goat, or they could have given a bullock. And yet these two turtle doves or young pigeons, these were the offering that people who had less means, who were more economically poor, this is what they could bring to the Lord. And isn't it wonderful uh, that the Lord, as we said before, saves rich and poor and the middle class for that matter. You know, it's not about how much money you have. And they came and brought what they could. But the salvation lay in that son they were presenting. It lay in what Jesus would do. The sacrifice they were offering 
was worship to God for what God had already provided. And those animal sacrifices that were offered for centuries could not save anyone. They merely depicted the salvation that God would provide in Christ. And so there was no righteousness that came to them through the animals. An animal can't confer righteousness. After all, an animal didn't have anything to do with the sin. An animal never robbed a bank or never uh, mugged somebody in an alley. Now, you don't hear about a gang of Holstein cows going around kidnapping people. No, it's people that do sin, right? It's mankind. And so Jesus took on him the seed of Abraham, Hebrews 2 says, that he might uh, release us, that he might be our kinsman redeemer and pay the debt we owed and bring us into the inheritance in glory that God has for us. Well, I hope you'll come to him today, my friend, and receive that full salvation. Or if you have it, I hope that you'll emulate Joseph and Mary in being obedient to the Lord's word. Not to offer sacrifices today. The temple is gone and the sacrifice that we trust in is the sacrifice that Christ offered on the cross. And thank God it never needs to be repeated. And the sacrifice is or, says the hymn writer. It's over. We don't need to do it again. So we can rejoice today in the sacrifice that Christ gave. And we can offer him the sacrifice of praise, which Hebrews 13 says is the fruit of our lips. May we indeed do so. Thank you for listening.